Okay, so we're back from our break, uh, and now we're going to talk about the immediate post-revolutionary moment in Russia and the historical avant-garde's that are involved there. So uh, with this one, I assigned you uh, chapter 1914, which talks about both Tatlin and Duchamp. And for this class, I asked you just to read the Tatlin section. Um, there is another chapter that's m that, that expounds a little more broadly on constructivism and productivism. I didn't assign that because then it would have gotten too unwieldy, especially for a summer course. Uh, but if you're interested in this history, I really recommend reading that chapter. It's the 1921 chapter. Um, it's actually really an important history, not for the his not only for the history of Russia, but the history of the avant-garde in the United States um, and the history of the avant-garde in um, in Latin America. Think of Brazilian artists in the 50s and 60s who are influenced by the legacy of constructivism. So it's a very, very important moment in the history of the historical avant-garde. So um, if you want a broader understanding, go to that chapter, and I will be covering a few of the ideas from that chapter in this lecture. So um, without further ado, let's go. Uh, so constructivism and then productivism. Uh, they're sequential, and they're the movements that, that arise and come forth after the success of the 1917 October Revolution. So it happens in 1917. Here's Lenin <clears throat> coming back after staying in, in Zurich, in Switzerland for some time. He's forced to leave. Funny enough, he's, he's, he's living right down the road from the Dadaist, who we're going to talk about next class. It's quite incredible. So here he is coming back and greeting everybody. Um, and this is the beginnings of the, of the October Revolution. It was in October, um, and that's why it's called the October Revolution. Um, and so let's talk very quickly about some of the ideals of the, of the revolution because I guess it's it's important and this will fill out what we had started to talk about in the first part of today's class. Um, so this is the first revolution in world history that was founded on Marxist political theory, um, on socialist and communist uh, political theory, which above all is based on solidarity and collectivity. Often at the... Um, um, often downplaying the individual, which would be a more um, liberal forms of political organization. Liberal in the old sense means individual. Liberal forms of political um, uh, political uh, systems privilege the individual over the collective. This is this is the opposite. Socialism and, and communism, which is which is. Um, um, well, I'm going to leave it at that. Socialism and communism, they privilege the collective, solidarity, um, the masses, um, um, rather than the, the individual. The idea is if you, if you, if you worry about solidarity and co collectivity, then everybody will be, every individual will be okay, will be cared for, um, and will live a life of dignity, dignity and happiness, and so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, as I said at the beginning of class, that uh, these collective forms of organization, especially if there's a strong leader that comes in, can turn into authoritarian nightmares, which is what's going to happen in Russia in the late 20s and 30s, especially once Stalin takes over from Lenin. But we're not going to talk about that history for this class. That'll be later in the semester. For now, we're going to talk about this incredible moment in 1917, where it really looked like the, the people and the working people had taken power. Um, and that the that history and the future of, of their country and communism always had international ambitions the history of the world would be one where there would be less exploitation where everybody would would um, be taken care of um, and have dignity um, and, and and so on and so forth and means to you know live live a life um, so this is a this is a very famous poster that depicts the the paradigms of the capitalist system. So Marx, very famously, his great work is is Cap Capital from um, 1871, that he envisioned to be in like it's crazy. That's huge, uh, like seven seven volumes. He only first the, he only wrote the first three volumes, and already those are like thousands of pages long. Um, but he but Marx is still one of those great thinkers um, as a diagnostician. Uh, he diagnosed what it meant to live under capitalism. He had a deep respect for capitalism. He understood that capitalism was a, was a key economic system for the development of world history. And it got us out of feudalism, it got us out of um, older economic models that weren't as good. Um, and there's no question that capitalism as an economic system is unrivaled in its ability 
to produce wealth. Um, that's, there's no question about that. So for Marx, the next step would have been then to start redistributing that wealth. Uh, because inherently, for him, capitalism is encoded with certain contradictions, where capitalism will eat itself. Um, it cannot be sustainable for, for Marx. And this, this poster will show you why. Um, so within the paradigm of what's important in a capitalist system, obviously profit, money, capital is at the top, right? Um, then at the next step are the, the leaders, so clergy, presidents, uh, führers, dictators, so on and so forth. They're yeah, prime ministers. They're in the middle. They're, they're right after cap the capital. Then it's the church. I'm sorry, this was a king, not a clergy. I'm sorry. Um, then there's the church. Remember, Marx, most Marx political theory will say that religion is something that... that um, is a, is a counter-revolutionary force. Um, it just keeps people in check and unquestioning about the world. Uh, so there's the clergy. Then the police state, the military and the police. Uh, we shoot at you. This certainly takes on a certain resonance right now with, um, with um, um, the protests that we're, that we're seeing against pr uh, police brutality. Um, and then the people that profit uh, they have less power, but they profit from from this structure of society. These are this is the bourgeoisie or the petite bourgeoisie. Those who own um, the factories, those who own the businesses, those who own their homes, those who have wealth um, and have certain amounts of power in society and security. Um, so, in since uh, Occupy Wall Street and then the the. Um, the emergence of Bernie Sanders as a as a political figure in this country, this we would now call the, this basically like the one percent, right? Um, or really probably really the point one percent. Um, and then everybody else, we're all here. Uh, these are all this is all the working class uh, people, people who don't have capital, they don't own things really, um, and the only thing they can do is sell their own time and their own labor and their own bodies um, to be able to survive. Um, so these are the people that are exploited by the top part of, of, of society. Now, Marx comes along and says, hey, wait a second. Are you looking at this picture? Uh, he wasn't liter literally looking at this picture, but are you looking at this picture? Um, do you not notice who's holding up the whole thing? Who really has the power in this poster? It becomes obvious that if the majority, if the mass of people who are keeping everything going, keeping everything up, start to realize that they're the ones keeping it up, they can tell everybody above them, they can say, hey, we're going to drop all this if you don't start like treating us better. If we don't, um, even more, if we don't have a different conception of society, one that's fair, one that's more just and, and more equal, and where everybody lives um, in, in dignity. And so this is what Marx called the proletariat, um, which he devises from Hegel. Hegel has a very famous theory of the master and the slave, um, very briefly, it basically says that uh, at first you think that those who are the masters are the ones with powers, and then anyone who's a slave, um, and by that he doesn't quite mean slave, but I mean he does, but um, um, anyone who's, who's subordinate to the master, um, you think it's the master that has power, uh, but then all of a sudden you realize that everything the master has is because of the slave. And that, in fact, really, it's the slave that has the power. It's the slave that even informs the master as to who he is and what he has. Right. So this is a, this is a, in in Hegel. This is more of an idealistic um, conception of history. But for Marx, he says, no, that's exactly how history goes. You have people that don't know they have all the power. Once I tell them, once people organize, and this is where you get unions and the history of labor rights and so on and so forth. Once people start to realize this, then they can start leveraging. Uh, then they can start using that power to go towards a more just world. Another siren. Okay, so uh, this is uh, this is an American cartoon from one that was based on a Russian cartoon. So this is all in English, right? This this is a very famous painting, the Pyramid of the Capitalist System, um, um, in uh, in American socialist circles, which were, believe it or not. Um, rather rather sizable in the early 20th century. It's based off of this 1900 Russian cartoon. So these are the ideals we're dealing with 
when we're talking about um, the Russian Revolution, the political ideology that's involved, um, and the idea, going back to Marx, that to understand capitalism, to understand society, and to understand history, you have to understand the antagonisms between these classes, and you have to understand that the material foundation of society, of politics, and history aren't these people, but it's the workers. They're the ones holding everything up. Okay, um, so you have, uh, in, in 1917, this overthrow of the Tsar, um, and for the first time in history, you do have this working class, um, uh, working class politics taking power. And you had all these, this, this changed the way in which art was, uh, was conceived, right? So I've given you a lot of political history here, but now we're gonna turn to the way this affected art making. Um, and that's the rest of today's class. So some of the things that, that they would do um, was stage mass spectacles. This is in 1920. Um, and it's restaging uh, the most probably the, the symbolically most important historical event from the 1917 revolution, which was the storming of the Winter Palace. And so this is a video of this. Uh, let me turn this down. There's no sound, but it's a video. So basically, you have all these actors and just normal everyday people, and they're there reenacting um, and commemorating this event from three years before. This is during the Russian Revolution. Um, and during the civil, uh, what's already becoming a civil war um, um, of the October Revolution. And so I don't know how far away we can get from even Malevich's paintings here, right? One of the key aspects of the historical avant-garde, one of the key aspects of this highly politicized historical avant-garde, like the futurists, is getting away from in, in their, their, in their um, activities that involve the public, and not so much their artworks, which, remember, were kind of conservative. One of the ambitions was to collapse art and life, collapse art and politics, and bring people into it. So I don't know what better example of a work of art than this massive theatrical reenactment of normal everyday people um, acting out this important moment for the, the Russian Revolution. And so this is so different from a conception of art as like the individual artist who makes the painting and he it, the credit goes to him um, and uh, he's the genius and so on and so forth. That for these revolutionaries and for the artists that are part of this revolution at this time, for them that's way too liberal. That's like, why, why do we care about the individual? Why don't we care about this... this uh, this quote-unquote genius genius artist, that he's not what we're, we're after. We're after a collective society of mutual dignity and justice and equality. So it would make sense that you have works of art that are like this, that encompass almost everybody, right? Um, they would take this to extremes, actually. So it's well known uh, that, that after the revolution, symphonies would start working without conductors, that conductors uh, were like, you know, the dictator, uh, the, 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 the individual who's there um, dictating how everybody plays, a more equal and just and collective understanding of the symphony would be to have no director at all. Everybody's equal. Interestingly enough, it didn't work out very well. It turns out you actually do need a conductor um, to go through scores and to keep, it, keep everybody on the same page, especially for large works. Um, so this is an interesting part of, of this history. Um, so it affected all forms of culture, of cultural organization at the time, be it music, being theater, being these mass spectacles. But it definitely um, affected painters and sculptors and artists that were working in the pre-revolutionary -re -pre avant-garde, and they're trying to decide, well, how do, we, how do we make art now, now that the revolution has happened? We can't make art in the same way. Um, we have to make an art that reflects the revolution, that reflects this new class, this proletariat, which is based on community and solidarity. Um, and we have to be materialist. In the same way that Marx is materialist in his conception of history, we have to make works that are in some ways materialist. Um, this is a very famous text by Alexei Gan, where he says, we must all become constructors in the general work of the arming and moving of the many million human masses. So the conception of the artist changes from the individual in society who makes these great works 
to one of many who are contributing to the revolution. So a very different conception of the artist than the one we've known in most other movements. And so here is where you get the idea of proletarian culture. Um, this is Rodchenko, probably the most important sculptor, um, artist of the post-revolutionary period. Look at, his, look, look at the way he's dressed. If I gave you this photograph, you would say, well, this guy's a car mechanic, <laughs> or he's like, he works in a factory, right? Um, there he is with his pipe, um, with his onesie, uh, and these big boots, and then his sculptures and, and behind him. Um, this is this is the artist almost more as a worker and not almost as a worker he's really modeling himself after like a working class conception of the artist so in proletarian culture um, culture was to be revolutionized on, uh, revolutionized on three fronts it would become a type of labor working art uh, uh, merging the artist and the worker together it would also be not only in the work itself but also in the lifestyle um, so the artist wouldn't think of himself as above society, like I'm the great artist and here all, here like the, all the stupid people who buy my work and, and, and enjoy my work and I'm like, great, right? Um, there was much more of an idea of, uh, of, of solidarity with the, with the working class um, at home and in, and in work. Like this should be a, a, total, um, a total lifestyle. Um, and the culture should also be uh, creating a re should also lend itself towards re um, creating and furthering a revolutionary um, consciousness. So once again, it should be against single authorship, but it, it, it must be collective. So it should be committed to a communist society. So you see how the, the Western conception of the artist since the Renaissance forward as the increasingly as like the solitary genius, the one who, who has authorship, that's going by the wayside here in this history and you'll see that affecting the work so one artist um, who is really the, f the in some ways the founder of constructivism of this idea of work almost as labor as construction that's why constructivism works so well as a term for this movement would be Vladimir Tatlin um, and he started working in a, a type of, of, of media where he would work with industrial materials not traditionally sculptural materials, but in this example, things like iron, stucco, glass, asphalt. Um, and he devised this very important uh, term called truth to materials. And truth to materials simply means that rather than the artist imposing his will on the media that he's using, so like make, using paint to, to paint something beautiful, or using marble to sculpt something beautiful, to like really impose his authorial will on an object. For Tatlin, truth, the materials meant letting the materials dictate the form. Letting the materials, what they're capable of or not capable of, as dictating the composition, the look, um, and the way in which the objects are formed. So he had certain theories about iron, he had certain theories about stucco, glass, asphalt, that he's deploying here, that there are certain things they could do and certain things they couldn't do, and he's highlighting what they can do. So he's exposing the truth of the inherent truth of the materials. And this gets back then to the idea of downplaying authorship, right? Because it's not so much him imposing what he wants the work to be, but it's the materials themselves that are imposing what the work is going to look like. Um, so um, it's an important idea. An idea that, then he, that he then puts to full use in a monument, um, one that was going to be built in 1920. It was never was, so we only have the model. Um, but the monument to the Third International, it would have been, it was this big meeting of, of, um, of the Communist Party at the time. Um, this is Tetlin's monument to the Third International, right here. Um, this is only the model. So it was going to be as big as the Tour Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, which was built in 1889, um, which is often considered as the first modern um, it's often considered to be like the first modern structure, um, modern monument, uh, mainly because of what it's made of. Um, it's these industrial materials. And he was influenced by, um, by the Tour Eiffel, as you can tell. Like he's also using iron, he's also using these modern alloy uh, metal um, um, materials, rather than older forms like a marble building or a marble um, 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 structure. And so uh, this, is, this was also a con considered a constructivist structure, right? 
Um, first, it was definitely modern because it was true to its materials. The famous poet Mayakovsky called it the first monument without a beard. Um, it, it, it used, um, it used the, the metals that it used um, and, and its materials according to what they could do. Um, second, it was entirely functional. That's the other thing about constructivism. They're going to move away from the idea of art as something that's passively looked at to art as something that can actually do something. It can actually affect things. It can actually be used, uh, which makes sense for a conception of art as a type of work, right? So it was functional. Unlike the, um, um, the Eiffel Tower, which was really only, it could be used as an antenna, um, Tetlin's monument would actually rotate. Um, it would be used as offices uh, for the, the party. Um, the bottom part would have rotated once a year. This part would have rotated once a month. This would have rotated once a week. This would have rotated once a day. And the top would have been like ro rotated once an hour or something like that, right? Okay, it was never built. It was never realized. But that was the idea, um, that it could be used as offices, um, that it was also used as a radio tower, as a means of communication. And then third, I've already talked about this, it was also dynamic, it moved. So a lot of the art that was made as part of the revolution was made to not be static, not be passive, but to move um, and to give you connotations of moving forward, forward in history, forward with the revolution, um, forward with, um, with these, these big ideas that were enacted um, in October of 1917. And this wasn't only, um, so, so Tatlin would have a big influence on the artists of the post-revolutionary period. So here you have the Society of, of Young Artists, a very famous exhibition where they showed their spatial constructions, where they too tried to stay true to the materials. Um, they also tried to show, uh, so you have this, these almost look like um, industrial objects rather than artworks, right? So there's this sort of working proletariat culture kind of vibe to these sculptures. Uh, they're true to their materials, so they're not trying to impose so much as letting the materials themselves dictate the form and the work of art. Um, they also showed the way they're made. They also showed the viewer um, their own making. So they didn't hide anything. This is the same thing with the Monument for the Third International. Another way to put this is to say that these works of art did not try to mystify anything. Like if you look at a Leonardo, however beautiful that painting is, it takes a lot of work to understand how he made it, right? Um, so there's like this, the, the brilliant Leonardo who's hiding from you the ways he made this work that you're enjoying. Um, within Marx's political theory, there would be all sorts of, of ways in which history is a form of mystication. Uh, mystification. Rulers uh, mystify um, or keep the masses ignorant. Um, the church mystify and keep the masses ignorant. The, the, the police and the, the military um, hide things. Um, um, they protect, they keep things hidden. They keep certain parts of society on one side and certain parts of society on the other. Um, and so the, 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 the bulk of, of the working class are, are in the dark. And so when you're seeing a work like this, like the first monument, or when you're seeing works like this that are totally transparent, where you can almost, by looking at them, you see the very components and the ways in which they were made, that should have a poetic resonance and a political one. That should tell you that these artists are not trying to hide anything. They're not trying to mystify anything. These works, if anything, are trying to demystify um, the, the way art is made um, and work and, and, and industrial materials and so on and so forth. So this is a really important idea and it makes a lot of sense within the context of the, the Russian Revolution. So unlike, let's say, uh, Balzac's very famous Beethoven, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, Rodin's very famous Balzac uh, statue, um, he just looks like Beethoven to me, so I always get it, I always get it mixed up, um, where you, you have the artist, uh, Rodin, the great like genius a sculptor, and you even see like his handprints. You even see him forming the mold that then will be casted. Uh, you literally have the imprint of the of the author. You don't have that at all in this work. Um, it's as if the materials themselves dictate the work rather than the artist. And Rachenko will take this the furthest in some ways. So this is his oval hanging construction. Uh, which is at MoMA, actually. One of these is, uh, is at MoMA. And it's usually hanging from the ceiling. 
So it's not like easel painting. It's not like a painting that's on the wall that is passively looked at. It's actually in the space. Um, never do this at MoMA because you'll get arrested. But uh, the idea was that you could actually then handle it. Um, it is movable. So it can collapse. Right now it's totally open, but it's, it collapsed. These are ellipses within ellipses, basically, right? And Rodchenko is also ascribing to this idea of truth to materials. Um, the material he's using, a wood, um, has certain properties, and he's using those properties to make um, this shape. There are certain things that wood can do, there are certain things that wood cannot do, right? So he's not dictating the form. The material itself is dictating the form. And he's gone even further. So Rachenko has this very important idea of the deductive structure, um, which sounds like a fancy term, but it's not really that fancy. A deductive structure is basically a structure that, again, shows you how it's made. Um, it's a structure that shows you its own organization. And in fact, the organization is inherent to the object. So the deductive structure here is that he started with his oval, and then rather than like you would with a painting where you have to make all these other decisions and it's the artist who, who starts to move things to get the ball rolling, the artist takes a back seat here and the object itself dictates the form of the work. You deduct the structure of the work um, by the, the object itself, by the material. So it's very simple. This hanging oval construction is one oval. And the next step is another oval that's slightly smaller. After that, another oval that's slightly smaller, and so on and so forth. So that it's not only movable, and it can be collapsed into a flat object, um, but it also um, dictates its own form. The structure of the work is dictated by the work itself, not by um, the artist as much. At least that's the idea of this proletarian culture uh, that, that Rachenko was about. So in 1921, Rodchenko very famously paints um, three monochromatic, monochromatic means a single color, three monochromatic canvases, one red, one yellow, one blue. Um, these are, of course, the primary colors from which all colors, from which all colors can be mixed. So a little bit like the, like the Zom poets that we talked about at the beginning of today's class, a little bit like Malevich, who's going to the zero degree of painting. Rodchenko is basically saying here in 1921, here is the basic here are the basic units of color here are the basic units of painting flatness color brush strokes but he's doing it not to then continue a history of painting anew as malevich did but he's doing it to kill painting altogether it's very famous he says i reduced paintings to its logical cl conclusion and exhibited three canvases red blue and yellow i affirmed it it's all over basic colors every plane is a plane and there's to be no more representation so for him getting to the to, to the pure distillation of what painting is is not to then begin anew but it's to forget painting altogether and start conceiving of art in a different way for Rodchenko and these constructivists and you're gonna see in a moment the productivists even works of art that are true to their materials um, that we've been talking about here even these objects they're they're too still they're still too discreet um, Yes, they're, they're downplaying the author. Yes, they look like industrial materials. Yes, they're influenced by proletariat culture. Um, yes, they've moved away from bourgeois easel painting from the past. Um, nonetheless, they're still not really active in society. They're not really a part of industry, even though they look like industry. Um, they're, they're not really collective. Um, even though they seem to be tapping into collective ideas. So here's where you get to the radical next step, which is which are the productivists. A lot of the constructivists will turn into productivists. And by productivists, we simply mean artists that leave art, art making um, behind altogether, um, and they start working for the state, and they start working for industry. So you had all these artists who, who, who wanted to contribute to the revolution, um, and they started making posters. They started working with uh, products um, and advertising for products um, and packaging. They wanted to make like real tangible um, contributions to this new society. So there's some very famous ones. There's a whole st study of this by uh, Christina Cayer, which is really good, um, of, of all these artists that were making all these really radical works that then basically started making 
um, um, works that were much more within a social and public space, like they're actually part of industry itself. So here's Rachenko. This is an advertising for uh, cookies, uh, um, um, Red October cookies, I think is what they're called. Yeah, Red October cookies. And then another one for pacifiers. Um, I always love this baby with the pacifiers because this almost doubles as a... You, you feel like you can pull this pin and the baby turns into like a, a grenade or something. It's a really a, a fascinating um, a fascinating design for a product. Um, and then the arms seem to be like... You know, these are hands, but it almost looks like explosions are shooting out. It's, it's pretty wild. Um, this wasn't met with much success. Uh, for the most part, these artists who wanted to go into industry, who actually wanted to start working in factories and collaborating with um, businesses um, and the state and state production, artists were treated as, uh, you know, like, what are you doing here? Um, this will happen to Bauhaus too when we get to Bauhaus. Um, but there was one artist who met with a, a considerable amount of success, um, or a couple actually, um, two, two women artists, um, uh, Popova and Stepanova, um, and they, decided, they designed uh, clothing. Um, this was clothing for an actor um, in, in theater, uh, sort of like this very working class sort of dress, um, and then designs for sports clothing um, that, that would be used. Um, so think of it like a, an artist producing the 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 jerseys for the the u.s soccer team um, um when they play in qatar in in 2022 um, rather than nike right sounds crazy uh, but that's what we had oh someone started to play the trumpet well we're, <laughs> we're almost at the end here so um so yeah we're at the end here so um like i was saying before this history of the avant-garde is going from these really these really uh, radical and, and experimental proletariat, uh, proletariat culture informed objects um, towards industry. Um, so we start with, product, with constructivism and then they go into industry with productivism. By the time you get to the mid 20s and especially the 30s, it's all over. Um, there are no constructivists, there are no productivists. Um, the only thing you can do as an artist is to work for what's an increasingly authoritarian, totalitarian. Um, state under Stalin and so some artists started working in photography some artists started making what is now you know basically propaganda for um, for an increasingly authoritarian um, communist state um, and some artists were killed some artists were sent to the gulags uh, some some many were disappeared um, along with poets and philosophers and so on and so forth which then gets us to the next phase of the history of uh, Russian art, um, which is what we're going to talk about later on in the semester when we talk about social uh, socialist realism. There was a mandate, basically, imposed by the government, by the state, um, and by Stalin, of what art could be like. And it had to be realist like this. It had to be like this work by Isaac Brodsky, Lenin and the Smolny Palace. So, uh, in... in um, in contrast to these very experimental works that we talked about right around the time of 1917 up into the early 20s, this could not be more rear guard. This could not be more conservative um, and representational <clears throat> and um, um, and almost populist in, in a way. Um, and here's where we end uh, with, with a certain amount of irony. Because while all these... Uh, these artists in the Russian avant-garde, while they were there for the people, while they were there trying to uh, be part of this working class um, revolution that was the beginnings of, of, of the October Revolution in Russia, their work was were never accepted by the public. The public had had more conservative tastes. Um, they just wanted, you know, they wanted nice pictures, reassuring um, picture uh, paintings that show skill, that show a story, that show narrative, so on and so forth. Um, so there's a certain amount of irony um, in this history where the very advanced avant-garde artists are working for everybody, but not everybody really appreciated or understood what they were doing. Um, and to be honest, looking at the history of scholarship, it's really only in the past 10, 20 years where, we're, where the, the scholarship is in place for us to really understand what they were doing with these experimental objects. Um, and that's what I've tried to explain to you um, in today's class.